vagabonds have marks they make on gateposts and trees and doors, letting others of their kind know a little about the people who live in the houses and farms they pass on their travels. I think cats must have similar signs. How else to explain the cats who turn up at our door through the year, hungry and flea-ridden and abandoned? We take them in. We get rid of the fleas and the ticks, feed them, and take them to the vet. We pay for them to get their shots, and indignity upon indignity, we have them neutered or spayed, and they stay with us for a few months, or for a year, or forever. Most of them arrive in the summer. We live in the country, just the right distance out of town for the city dwellers to abandon their cats near us. We never seem to have more than eight cats, rarely have less than three. The cat population in my house is currently as follows. Hermione and Pod, Tabby and Black, respectively, the mad sisters who live in my attic office and do not mingle. Princess, the blue-eyed, long-haired white cat who lived wild in the woods for years before she gave up her wild ways for soft sofas and beds. And last, but largest, Furball. Princess's cushion-like calico, long-haired daughter, orange and black and white, whom I discovered as a kitten in our garage one day, strangled and almost dead, her head poked through an old badminton net, and who surprised us all by not dying, but instead growing up to be the best-natured cat I have ever encountered. And then there is the black cat, who has no other name than black cat. He turned up almost a month ago. We did not realize he was going to be living here at first. He looked too well-fed to be a stray, too old and jaunty to have been abandoned. He looked like a small panther. He moved like a patch of night. One day in the summer, he was lurking about our ramshackle porch, eight or nine years old, I guess. Male, greenish yellow of eye, very friendly, quite imperturbable. I assumed he belonged to a neighboring farm or a household. I went away for a week to finish writing a book, and when I came home, he was still on the porch, living in an old cat bed one of the children had found for him. He was, however, almost unrecognizable. Patches of fur had gone, and there were deep scratches on his gray skin. The tip of one of his ears was chewed away. There was a gash beneath one eye a slice gone from one lip. He looked tired and thin. We took the black cat to the vet, where we got him some antibiotics, which we fed him each night, along with his soft cat food. We wondered who he was fighting. Princess, our white, beautiful, near feral queen? Raccoons? Rat-tailed fanged possum? Each night, Scratches would be worse. One night, his side would be chewed up. The next, it would be his underbelly, raked with a claw mark and bloody to the touch. When it got to that point, I took him down to the basement to recover, beside the furnace and the piles of boxes. It was surprisingly heavy, the black cat, and I picked him up and carried him down there with a cat basket and a litter bin and some food and water. I closed the door behind me. I had to wash the blood from my hands when I left the basement. He stayed down there for four days. At first, he seemed too weak to feed himself. A cut beneath one of his eyes had rendered him almost one-eyed, and he limped and lolled weakly, thick yellow pus oozing from his cut in his lip. I went down there every morning and every night, and I fed him and gave him his antibiotics. 
which I mixed with his canned food, and I dabbed at the worst of his cuts and spoke to him. He had diarrhea, and although I changed his litter daily, the basement stank evilly. The four days that the black cat lived in the basement were a bad four days in my house. The baby slipped in a bath and banged her head and might have drowned. I learned that a project I had set my heart on was no longer going to happen, and I realized that I did not have the energy to begin again from scratch, pitching it to other networks or to other media. My daughter left for summer camp and immediately began to send home a plethora of heart-tearing letters and cards, five or six each day, imploring us to take her away. My son had some kind of fight with his best friend to a point that they were no longer on speaking terms. And returning home one night, my wife hit a deer who ran out in front of the car. The deer was killed. The car was left undrivable. My wife sustained a small cut over one eye. By the fourth day, the cat was prowling the basement, walking haltingly but impatiently between the stacks of books and comics, the boxes of mail and cassettes of pictures and of gifts and of stuff. He meowed at me to let him out, and reluctantly, I did so. He went onto the back porch and slept there for the rest of the day. The next morning, there were deep new gashes in his flank and clumps of black hair. His covered the wooden boards of the porch. Letters arrived that day from my daughter, telling us that camp was going better and she thought she could survive a few days. My son and his friends sorted out their problem. Although what the argument was about, trading cards, computer games, Star Wars, or a girl, I would never learn. The executive who vetoed my project was discovered to have been taking bribes, well, questionable loans, from an independent production company and was sent home on permanent leave. His successor, I was delighted to learn, when she faxed me was a woman who had initially proposed a project to me before leaving the station. I thought about returning the black cat to the basement, but decided against it. Instead, I resolved to try and discover what kind of animal was coming to our house each night, and from there to formulate a plan of action, to trap it perhaps. For birthdays and at Christmas, my family gives me gadgets and gizmos, pricey toys which excite my fancy, but ultimately rarely leave their boxes. There's a food dehydrator, an electric carving knife, a bread making machine, and last year's present, a pair of see in the dark binoculars. On Christmas day, I had put the batteries into the binoculars and had walked about the basement in the dark, too impatient even to wait until nightfall, stalking a flock of imaginary starlings. You were warned not to turn it on in a light that would have damaged the binoculars and quite possibly your eyes as well. Afterward, I had put the device back in its box and it sat there still in my office, beside the box of computer cables and forgotten bits and pieces. Perhaps, I thought, if the creature, dog or cat or raccoon, or what have you, were to see me sitting on the porch, it would not come. So I took a chair into the box and coat room, a little larger than a closet, which overlooks the porch. And when everyone in the house was asleep, I went out onto the porch and bade the black cat good night. That cat, my wife had said when he first arrived, is a person, and there was something very person-like in his huge leonine face, his broad black nose, his greenish yellow eyes, his fanged but amiable mouth, still leaking amber pus from the right lower lip. I stroked his head and scratched him beneath the chin, 
and wished him well. Then I went inside and turned off the light on the porch. I sat on my chair in the darkness inside the house with the scene of dark binoculars on my lap. I had switched the binoculars on and a trickle of greenish light came from the eyepieces. Time passed in the darkness. I experimented with looking at the darkness with the binoculars, learning to focus, to see the world in shades of green. I found myself horrified by the number of swarming insects I could see in the night air. It was as if the night world were some kind of nightmarish soup swimming with life. Then I lowered the binoculars from my eyes and stared out at the rich blacks and blues of the night, empty and peaceful and calm. Time passed. I struggled to keep awake, found myself profoundly missing cigarettes and coffee, my two last addictions. Either of them would have kept my eyes open, but before I had tumbled too far into the world of sleep and dreams, a yell from the garden jerked me fully awake. I fumbled the binoculars to my eyes and was disappointed to see that it was merely Princess, the white cat streaking across the front garden like a patch of greenish white light. She vanished into the woodland to the left of the house and was gone. I was about to settle myself back down when it occurred to me to wonder what exactly had startled Princess so. And I began scanning the middle distance with the binoculars, looking for a huge raccoon, a dog, or a vicious possum. And there was indeed something coming down the driveway towards the house. I could see it through the binoculars, clear as day. It was the devil. I had never seen the devil before, and although I had written about him in the past, if pressed, would have confessed that I had no belief in him other than as an imaginary figure, tragic and Miltonian. The figure coming up the driveway was not Milton's Lucifer, it was the devil. My heart began to pound in my chest so hard that it hurt. I hoped it could not see me, that in a dark house behind window glass, I was hidden. The figure flickered and changed as it walked up the drive. One moment, it was dark bull-like, like a minotaur. The next, it was slim and female. And the next, it was a cat itself. A scarred, huge, gray-green wild cat. Its face contorted with hate. There are steps that lead up to my porch. Four white wooden steps in need of a coat of paint. I knew they were white, although they were like everything else, green through my binoculars. At the bottom of the steps, the devil stopped and called out something that I could not understand. Three, perhaps four words in a whining, howling language. It must have been old and forgotten when Babylon was young. And although I did not understand the words, I felt the hairs raise on the back of my head as it called. And then I heard, muffled through the glass, but still audible, a low growl, a challenge, 
and slowly, unsteadily, a black figure walked down the steps of the house, away from me, toward the devil. These days, the black cat no longer moved like a panther. Instead, he stumbled and rocked like a sailor only recently returned to land. The devil was a woman now. She said something soothing and gentle to the cat in a tongue that sounded like French and reached out a hand to him. He sank his teeth into her arm and her lip curled and she spat at him. The woman glanced up at me. Then, and if I had doubted that she was a devil before, I was certain of it now. The woman's eyes flashed red fire at me. But you can't see no red through night vision binoculars. Only shades of green. The devil saw me through the window. It saw me. And I am in no doubt about that at all. The devil twisted and writhed. And now it was some kind of jackal. A flat-faced, huge-headed, bull-necked creature, halfway between a hyena and a dingo. There were maggots squirming in its mangy fur, and it began to walk up the steps. The black cat leaped upon it, and in seconds they became rolling, writhing things, moving faster than the eyes could follow. All this in silence, and then a low roar down the country road at the bottom of the drive, in the distance lumbered a late night truck, its blazing headlights burning bright as green suns through the binoculars. I lowered them from my eyes and saw only darkness and the gentle yellow of headlights and then the red of rear lights as it vanished off again into nowhere at all. When I raised the binoculars once more, there was nothing to be seen, only the black cat on the steps staring up into the air. I trained the binoculars up and saw something flying away. A vulture, perhaps, or an eagle. And then it flew beyond the trees and was gone. I went out onto the porch and picked up the black cat and stroked him and said kind, soothing things to him. He meowed pitifully when I first approached him, but after a while he went to sleep on my lap and I put him into his basket and went upstairs to my bed to sleep myself. There was dried blood on my t-shirt and jeans the following morning. That was a week ago. The thing that comes in my house does not come every night but it comes most nights. We know it by the wounds on the cat and the pain I can see in those leonine eyes. He has lost the use of his left front paw and his right eye has closed for good. I wonder what we did to deserve the black cat. I wonder who sent him and selfish and scared. I wonder how much more he has left to give.